All right, uh, I guess in the interest of time, we might uh, uh, start the session. So first of all, uh, good afternoon, senior officers. And uh, <laughs> good afternoon, senior officers. <laughs> and good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Look, uh, I think we're in for a bumper session this afternoon. And uh, I think we, we're very grateful to the organising committee for having invited uh, Defence to to present and we hope uh, to deliver on that uh, request this afternoon. What we plan to do is take you on a, uh, a journey um, that will show you some of the capability and some of the techniques and strategies we employ in the uh, uh, military medical uh, sphere. By way of acknowledgements and declarations, it's important to uh, note that this uh, presentation has had prior Surgeon General approval and the opinions expressed are those of um, the individual officers and not necessarily of the uh, Defence Force. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think what I'll do initially is I'll just introduce our team. And uh, as we're apt to do in the Defence Force, we always uh, start from the top and work down. And uh, so first of all, uh, <coughs> Air, Air Commodore Jenny Lumsden, uh, a remarkable uh, Officer, nursing officer, administrator, teacher, educator. I've had the good fortune of uh, uh, being trained by her in um, aeromedical retrieval, matters, uh, aeromedical retrieval, and uh, a wonderful experience. And I'm looking forward to uh, what she has to tell us this afternoon. Next, a great uh, friend of mine, uh, <coughs> Colonel Reed, sir. Good afternoon. Good to have you here. And uh, we always get a, a lot of value out of uh, uh, Colonel Reed. He's a <coughs> Tremendous Army Reserve Officer, and he also holds the uh, uh, portfolio at the current time of Professor of Military Medicine and Surgery. And so uh, he's a go-to man if you've got any ideas. Next, Sue Sharp. Um, I've had the, I've had the uh, great privilege of sharing a tent in, West <laughs> <laughs> in, in Western Australia with, uh, with Sue, and, um, um, and we've both endured the horrors that no naval officer should have to endure of pit latrines and, and no running water. And we came away with our friendship intact, so I think uh, I'm looking forward to what she has to say. Major Tanya um, Rogerson is a specialist anaesthetist, Army Reserve officer, has done a fair bit of work with the uh, Special Forces, and she's going to have some entertaining uh, uh, stuff for us this afternoon as well. Then <coughs> my great friend, uh, Dan, who looked after me on my first deployment to Afghanistan. D uh, Dan is a, uh, an outstanding soldier, an outstanding uh, um, medical practitioner. He was blown up on that, on that tour and indeed uh, received a commendation for, for distinguished service. Isn't that right, Dan? That's, uh, we're very privileged to have him here this afternoon. And then <clears throat> getting towards the end, uh, <laughs> squadron leader Rebecca Heron. She uh, has really and truly gone to a lot of effort to make this happen today and uh, put a lot of things in place and we're very grateful uh, to squadron leader Rebecca Heron for, for being here and she's a critical care nurse, she's a uh, uh, retrievalist and uh, a whole other range of skills and um, I think I'm similarly looking forward to hearing from, from her today. <coughs> and then finally Ben Mackey critical care nurse, captain out of uh, Toowoomba, uh, Army Reserve officer, and all-round good egg. So, fantastic. <laughs> so, so just uh, uh, a, a great panel and a good lineup this afternoon. So, what I'd like to do now is set the scene. I'd like you guys to come with us on a journey, and we'll start that by just reflecting on where we're going to go on this journey. So, point of injury, through to the emergency department, into the operating theatre, onto the intensive care, and hopefully we get our casualties home. Let's uh, set that scene. Welcome to breaking news tonight. The unrest in the Iron Islands has erupted into overt civil war, and the latest reports suggest Westeros has sent in armed forces in a bid to prevent secession. Let's cross to Ali for the latest. Thank you, Seb. The events here are dramatic. 
The fighting has been described as fierce, with many casualties, including women and children. We understand the Australian Defence Force has launched a mission to secure the safe evacuation of its nationals and diplomatic staff. The Australian ship HMAS Canberra, thought to be carrying soldiers, equipment and medical capability, sailed two days ago and is reported to be off the coast of the Iron Islands. Back to you, Seb. Thank you, Ali. The international community has strongly condemned the civil war and urges all parties to return to the negotiating table before further destruction and loss of life. We will continue to bring you live reports as events unfold. So there's a ship standing on station, um, 20 nautical miles off the coast of the Iron Islands, carrying some 1,400 soldiers who start to disembark the ship, uh, reading for their mission. There's several ways they can leave the ship. They can use uh, small boats, uh, obviously um, helicopter um, infiltration of, of troops is, is very effective and the ship has a number of uh, helos on board and you can deliver a significant number of sol soldiers in a very short uh, time frame. In terms of big numbers, we use landing craft to move uh, significant numbers ashore, as you can see in that picture. And so our guys go ashore and they start to establish a beachhead. And uh, Dan is their medical officer, and he's the uh, regimental medical officer. And uh, he's just... So Dan, at the end of this, you have three casualties. You've had, uh, in this very brief engagement, you've got a fellow that's been hit with a uh, RPG, and he's got a right uh, upper limb amputation and a right lower limb amputation. There's a fellow that has a penetrating brain injury or head injury, and there's a fellow that has uh, chest and abdominal wounds. Can you please take us on that journey? <coughs> So th thank you, Anthony, for your kind introduction and for organising this panel. Uh, it is a pleasure to be invited to discuss uh, point of injury care and forward AME uh, today. So the scenario you've presented is very realistic of the types of uh, casualties or, or um, uh, wounds we'd likely to see on, on the modern battlefield today. But before I get into the medical management, I'd just like to discuss some of the planning, um, the medical planning that would lead to some very, reali some very realistic assumptions um, of the assets available to me as a forward medical officer. A successful mission is likely to save more lives than any medical care. So the medical element is the insurance policy for the commander when things go wrong. I like to get involved early in the uh, military planning process with the command team uh, to make an assessment of what the composition of the medical element on the ground will be. I base this on the most likely course of action, uh, that's being a single penetrating gunshot wound, uh, and that's mitigated by every soldier carrying an, indiv an individual first aid kit, uh, which includes a combat application tourniquet, a cat, uh, and a pressure bandage, and the most dangerous course of action. And I assess this uh, to be an insurgent ch chopper crashing, and that's mitigated by having a medical element on the ground, led by a medical officer that can cater for two cat offer and four cat bravo casualties. There is a saying uh, in, the mili in, med in military planning that we plan for the most likely course of action and we cater for the most dangerous course of action. The medical disposition on the ground uh, is based on the most dangerous course of action. And this will include the medical officer with uh, two medics based in the company headquarters and one integral medic in each platoon. That makes a total of five medics uh, plus the medical officer on the ground which is essentially, in military terms, a tactical primary health care team, or a PHCT. Just talking about equipment, what we carry is exemplified in this image, uh, taken uh, just before uh, we boarded a chopper for a 24-hour mission in Helmand province in Afghanistan. You're essentially limited by what you can carry and fight with. Everything must be ro robust and what we call man-packable. On top of the medical kit, you must also carry things like your water, your rations, your radio equipment, and, uh, and your weapon. And as you can see, we must also be prepared to fight at night with night fighting equipment and also in all weather. 
So the major medical equipment that I would uh, usually carry would include an airway kit with an inhalo uh, oxygen cylinder, um, normal saline as my fluids, a drug case with analgesics, um, anaesthetic agents and IV antibiotics, and uh, there's, there's a whole heap of different uh, dressing types that we'd, we'd normally take with us, pelvic binders, soft litter, a hypothermia kit, paediatric kit, uh, amongst other things. So given the limitations that the, deployment, that the deployment places on both manpower and equipment, I assess the medical capability to be fairly good for the Platinum 10. The Platinum 10 is that treatment given in the, given in the first 10 minutes for major haemorrhage, uh, compromised airway and attention pneumothorax, and fair for the golden hour. But this is at the expense of extended field care. I'll just mention about the golden hour, and I'll, I'll go into it a little bit later. So that's a, that's a term used by the US military, and the clock starts when the nine-liner is first sent from the field, and it stops uh, when the wheels are down or, or the chopper lands at the medical treatment facility for damage control surgery. So the purpose of this planning is to tease out the limitations and capability that need to be mitigated, and I will then take these to the commander for action prior to the actual mission or the deployment commencing. Firstly, the limitations in the medical capabilities on the ground must be, mitigate, must be mitigated by having a dedicated rotary wing AME platform. There was a lot of background discussion about how this rotary wing AME platform uh, should look uh, for the future ADF. Uh, there's talk about a MERT type uh, capability, physician led, or a swoop and scoop. It's not my intention today to, to fuel this debate, other than to use the saying that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And, uh, and my medics would be delighted to see any platform uh, arrive on the ground in any way, shape or form, and the sooner the better. My experience is that operations in non-permissive environments will require a robust AME plan, and that's actually prior to getting the senior operational commander's final approval. So that actually makes AME within the golden hour a go or no-go criteria for the entire mission. It's a must-have. The next point about training is, uh, is the, the disposition of combat forces on the ground may mean that these casualties will only be seen by their platoon medic and not myself as the medical officer prior to the AME for damage control surgery. This necessitates an advanced skill set for our medics, which must include placement of surgical airways and being able to decompress a chest to be able to operate within that golden hour. TCCC. I'll now get into actually how it works on the ground for which we generally follow the TCCC principles. Tactical combat casualty care. It's a set of pre-hospital trauma care guidelines customised for use on the battlefield. Uh, it was introduced in 1996 and is reviewed annually by the Committee on TCCC. It's a US-based system um, and it was uh, instigated, um, it's been around, as, as it says there now, for, for just on 20 years and uh, it's, it's run by an ex-Marine uh, medical officer um, and it's something that uh, it takes on many different names and shapes and forms in different militaries around the world, but the TCCC is the basic principle. So TCCC actually steps through three phases of casualty care, from the initial wounding through to the arrival at the medical treatment facility. The first phase is care under fire, which includes self-aid and buddy aid. What we say is you're, you're still downrange, so you're still downrange where, uh, where all the fighting is happening. So the priority is to control any life-threatening external hemorrhage with that combat application tourniquet uh, and to continue the firefight. Every soldier will carry an, individu an individual first aid kit, that's an IFAC, and amongst other things that includes the combat application tourniquet, the CAT, shell dressings, a uh, 10 milligram uh, morphine auto-injector, as well as some hemostatic dressings, uh, NPAs and the like. It is usual at the end of this phase that the platoon signaller would then send through the nine lighter with a missed report. The AME is actually not allowed to launch uh, from its firm base until the nine liner is received, and it's imperative, therefore, that this is sent off as soon as possible. For completeness, I've included the entire nine liner here, but the medically important points that will be, uh, that as the medical officer or the medic will require input to, are those in bold. So the receipt of this nine liner at the main base will usually result in a complete telecommunications block from the base, thus allowing time for the official notifications team back at home to notify the casualties next of kin before any well-meaning friends um, would be able to call home and, and notify them uh, through any other way.
The second phase is tactical field care. So depending on the tactical scenario and the disposition of forces, tactical field care would be provided by the platoon medic or by the medical officer in the uh, PHCT, the primary health care team. So bringing it back into the scenario, I'll now quickly go through the medical management we can offer to each casualty uh, within this tactical field care phase. For patient one with the amputated right arm and leg, they would receive a cat to their arm and leg uh, and a hemostatic dressing, uh, IV or IO access, analgesia and IV antibiotics. For patient two with a penetrating brain injury, they would receive a NPA with oxygen. Um, I would hold off but be prepared to intubate. Hypertonic, sal hypertonic saline, uh, positioning head up and avoiding hypothermia. These are just things that we can do in the field. It's not much, as I said, it's all really limited by what we can carry on our, on our back. A point to note is that this patient requires a neurosurgeon who's usually located at the Roll 3 hospital. But in this scenario, we'll be uh, evacuating this casualty back to the Roll 2 on HMAS Canberra. And for patient three with a gunshot wound to the chest and abdomen, would receive uh, wound packing, bilateral chest tubes, Fluids, as I mentioned before, we only carry normal saline forward, uh, TXA and analgesia. One of the major challenges that we do face in tactical field care are uh, junctional hemorrhages and also uh, non-compressible penetrating abdominal wounds. Uh, these are our worst nightmare. Tactical evacuation care is the final phase of TCCC. It can be either through Medivac or Kazavac uh, and is an opportunity for resupply of consumables to be dropped from the evacuation platform. The casualty must be packaged appropriately, appropriately for flight, uh, especially for protection from noise, vibration and the cold. These are the timings that we use just for planning purposes. And, uh, and before any mission, we'll brief all of these timings to soldiers so that they know in the back of their mind that if they do become a casualty, that they're 70 minutes away from having surgery. Obviously, when a casualty does occur, it's all hands on deck and, uh, and the management of that casualty becomes the singular focus of all forces on the ground. But the two timings that I can influence are on the ground to bring this below the 70 minutes are the first timing there, the 15 minutes from time of injury to an eyeliner, the 15 minutes is just a planning time. So what we do is we, draw, we try to drop that nine liner as soon as we possibly can. And the fourth timing there, the time at the HLZ. Having the casualty packaged and ready for loading when the chopper arrives at the HLZ will also reduce this time to less than one minute. Helicopter crews have also been known to reduce that second time, that 15 minutes to wheels up of the rotary ring AME platform. Uh, I've, I've seen helicopter crews be able to get up uh, within seven minutes of receiving the nine liner. And I'll just add that there are many people here today who are infinitely more qualified than I, than I am to talk about the, uh, the, the process and the progress through the medical treatment facility, which is really where I'll leave it here today. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks and I'll much, just Dan. leave with some concluding remarks, um, which I went through. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Dan. I think probably, Dan, you just mind taking it on? There you go. So now what we've got, uh, Dan has packaged those patients and they're on their way uh, back to the ship. Just kidding. Okay, okay. Yeah, so here's just um, uh, some views. This is uh, at, on HMAS Canberra. You can see the medics uh, surrounding our patient and transit through. Quite a tight space, as you can imagine. Okay. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for the opportunity of being here today and presenting and to uh, give a little bit of emergency medicine and Navy flavour to the talk. Uh, I've recently served on board HMAS Canberra uh, for a deployment uh, and a, an exercise, multinational exercise just off Hawaii, which was a tough gig. 
And, uh, <laughs> and after spending a long time in the Navy, I've got to say these new ships uh, at uh, Adelaide and, and Canberra are incredibly impressive and if you ever do get an opportunity to have a look at them, I would certainly uh, take that. Today I'll just be talking briefly about um, Canberra's capability, also the emergency department organisation, how we run things, uh, and just some of the options for the critical casualties that we have. So our patients have arrived on board HMAS Canberra, uh, which is an amphibious assault ship, uh, which has about 27,000 tonnes, uh, which is big. There's a ship's company of about 400. They're the people who are required to actually keep the ship operating. And Canberra also has um, ability for about another 1,000 people. Uh, most of those are usually Army ground troops. Uh, there's also uh, other operational personnel, uh, you know, if we need translators, if we need intelligence people or anyone else important for the uh, deployment. And uh, then, of course, you've got the Maritime Operational Health Unit, uh, which is what we'll be talking about here. So MOHU is uh, predominantly um, made up of specialist doctors, nurses, um, allied health professionals, medics. Uh, we've got radiographers, uh, physios, lab techs. So it's, it's a really, um, it's a good, it's like a mini hospital basically. And we're located in what's called the PCRF or the Primary Casualty Reception Facility. Um, and as Anthony mentioned before, we've got um, transfer capabilities depending on the speed that we need to transfer the patient uh, and the nature of the patient, how sick they are and how transportable they are. So our casualties are embarked on board um, and they, in our case, they've come by helicopter. They can also come by landing craft and you saw one of those in one of the earlier pictures um, and they actually um, drive into the uh, well dock which is the back of the ship opens up and they basically drive, uh, they, they drive in. Uh, they're also then transported to the PCRF via a designated lift system, which uh, only medical people can use. So here's just some photographs uh, of our emergency department. Um, when the casualties arrive, they're uh, met by three research teams. I promise that wasn't me. Um, either myself or another face them um, would be running the overall um, organisation of the emergency department um, so that we've got clear oversight of the whole uh, situation and also to provide command important and relevant information that they may need to, uh, to arrange transfer and other, and other operational things. So each team would be led by either an emergency doctor or a um, specially trained emergency nurse or quick care nurse or a medic. Uh, uh, and the roles that we have on board in our team is the same as you would see in any emergency department. So you've got your airway, you've got your circulation and access, the scribe, the drug administration. So it, it all very much shadows what, what we do in our uh, non-military lives. When you consider the space available, uh, you know, those of you who think that an emergency department in a hospital is cramped, um, we consider that quite palatial by comparison. Um, that little, uh, see if I've got the, that's the little trolley that we get patients around. Um, as you can imagine, when you've got 90 degree bends and very tight corridors on a ship, uh, a normal hospital trolley just wouldn't cut it. So we've got this little two-wheeled uh, two uh, trolley which actually works really well and is very manoeuvrable. Again, just transferring the patient across. And that's just another uh, look at the, on the ED and there's uh, Commander Holly, who uh, is fortunately on board with us today. Fortunately, on this deployment, as well as having Commander Holly there, uh, we've got anaesthetists, intensivists, uh, surgeons of every uh, different breed, uh, specialist nurses, allied health professionals, um, and uh, imaging and labs. Um, 
what would normally happen during a recess is that those people who aren't directly involved in the recess would stand behind that yellow line. I'm not sure whether you noticed that, but that's at the forward end of the compartment. Uh, so they're there basically observing what's going on and also obviously looking and planning uh, how they're going to deal with these patients when they arrive in the operating theatre. Uh, they're also there in case we need them. If we've got, a, say, a difficult airway, we would call the anaesthetist to help out. Uh, we've also got uh, ultrasounds and x-ray facilities on board, including a mobile uh, x-ray, uh, and our lab tech is able to run bloods and do cross matches, blood gases and biochemical screens. So it's a really good setup. So you can see that yellow line there, and you can see some of our uh, colleagues just uh, with their backs to the wall watching and taking notes. So we're going to concentrate just on one of the casualties, uh, which was the uh, hemodynamically unstable soldier with the gunshot wounds. Um, thanks to Major Webber's team's excellent uh, management, uh, they've gained access, uh, IV access, they've given judicious fluids and given some tranexamic acid. And he arrives in our ED uh, critically injured but still alive. Clinical and radiological uh, evaluation uh, leads us to the conclusion that the gunshot wound to his chest was actually superficial, um, but he does have uh, a penetrating wound to his abdomen, and ultrasound has shown that he has free fluid. His distal pulses are weak and thready. Unfortunately, shortly after we receive him, he uh, suffers a cardiac arrest, and we were able to see with um, the cardiac, uh, the ultrasound that he had he did still have uh, cardiac wall movement. So, what do we do now? What are our options at this point? Um, this would be an incredibly challenging situation, even in a tertiary trauma centre, uh, let alone on our you know, remote floating emergency department. This casualty meets the criteria for aortic occlusion. Uh, which is at this point probably going to be the only uh, life-saving intervention which is available. Traditionally, uh, an emergency department thoracotomy would be performed, um, either by the emergency physician or if we have a trauma surgeon available. Um, the advantages of thoracotomy in this case would be obviously to get access to the descending aorta. Also, we'd be able to explore the chest further to see if there are any um, wounds, further wounds in the chest. Um, we're also fortunate that we have the surgical capacity to deal with not only the uh, initial wounds, but the substantial damage that we cause the patient by doing the thoracotomy. Uh, a, a recent study of just over 100 combat uh, casualties in Iraq who, sustain, who required emergency department thoracotomy actually showed that there was a 12% um, long-term survival without neurological deficit. So even though those numbers are small, um, it's actually um, it's a significant uh, result, uh, particularly if you're one of those 12%. Uh, thoracotomy, however, is a highly, uh, a maximally invasive procedure with a very high risk of damage to vessels and other underlying structures. Uh, it carries significant blood loss and long-term rehabilitation and post-operative care for those who survive it. Um, it's also a relatively rare procedure, um, even in trauma centres, and um, a lot of trauma surgeons and emergency physicians will never ever do one. Uh, saying that, we do, most of us uh, take special care in making sure that we have regular um, sim sessions and training so that if we do need to do it, we can do it. The other option is uh, what's called REBOA. Um, in recent years, REBOA, which stands for Resuscitative Endovascular Balloon Occlusion of the Aorta, uh, has become more widespread, um, both in ED and also pre-hospital, uh, including a successful procedure done in London um, by the HEMS team um, of a doctor and a paramedic after a patient was, uh, a, the a pedestrian was hit by a car. It involves placement of an endovascular balloon not there, um, in the aorta control, to control distal hemorrhage. Um, the concept isn't new. Uh, 
the same principle has been used to uh, stop bleeding in other forms of surgery, say aortic aneurysm repair, postpartum hemorrhage, GI bleeds, um, pelvic trauma. Uh, and it's far less physically invasive than an emergency department thoracotomy. Uh, and it does tend to give better uh, physiological parameters. Um, and it's also um, seems to have high rates of technical success. But it is a, a relatively new procedure and it's something that most emergency physicians would not have seen or done. Uh, it basically involves accessing the femoral artery, uh, usually under ultrasound. Um, if any of you have actually tried to um, palpate a femoral pulse in an arrest or peri-arrested patient, um, if you can do one, you're doing much better than me. Even under ultrasound, it's quite, it's quite difficult. Um, you uh, insert a, a 12 French sheath um, and through that, the balloon catheter. Um, you then inflate the balloon with a, a saline contrast mix so that you can then see radiologically that it's in the right spot. Uh, the procedures that are used are actually quite familiar to most of us here. Um, certainly most emergency physicians, anaesthetists or intensivists um, use these kind of procedures quite frequently. Um, the position of the balloon placement deter is determined by where the bleed is, which isn't surprising. Uh, We've arbitrarily divided the aorta into three zones, as you can see. Um, so zone one is from the left subclavian down to the celiacs. Zone two is um, down to the um, renal arteries. And zone three is infrarenal down to the bifurcation. Uh, abdominal trauma would uh, result in a zone one balloon and pelvic trauma, you would put it in zone three. So which procedure? Uh, in this case, uh, as with um, any good conference scenario, uh, we decided to put in a Reboa and the patient did exceptionally well. Um, we were able to do this because uh, when we looked at the chest, uh, the chest trauma wasn't uh, in fact invasive, so we were happy that there wasn't any thoracic aorta damage, which is a contraindication to Reboa. Otherwise, we would have been mandated to have done a thoracotomy to explore that. Um, so uh, we were pleased to say that the patient stabilised. We got return of spontaneous circulation, uh, and we also stabilised the other two patients uh, through our wonderful care. And uh, then I was able to hand the patients over to uh, Major Rogerston, who uh, carried on with their journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm an anaesthetist in the Army, and uh, in the military setting, the anaesthetist I mean, basically, you don't have as many resources as you do in a normal hospital, so manpower is quite important. So an anaesthetist would generally not just hang in uh, the operating theatre, would uh, supplement uh, the trauma bay, uh, help with retrieval, and uh, um, the, the, the pressure, obviously, is in the multi-casualty scenario. You've got limited resources, limited manpower. So I think one, one of obviously the big things that anaesthetists do help with is analgesia. And if you have a patient with gunshot wounds or traumatic amputations, and obviously, um, you know, analgesia is, is something that's really important. And um, Dan mentioned the auto-injectors for morphine. You know, the, um, there's, there was time when every, all the soldiers would carry an auto-injector, but obviously that's, that has limitations um, with uh, intramuscular um, blood supply. Um, Methoxyflurane is something that the medics... Um, um, or are qualified in using. Nowadays, though, that f fentanyl lollipops has actually generally uh, become uh, more in vogue and it's good, got 50% bioavailability, works quickly, um, and um, intranasal hasn't quite yet reached um, common use, but obviously in civilian practice is quite common. Um, ketamine's been around in military anaesthesia and analgesia for a long time, um, and Procedural sedation is obviously um, important for um, um, painful, 
painful procedures um, in the battlefield space. And uh, certainly in, in the States, their medics um, have actually protocols for field amputations for wounded uh, casualties on the battlefield who are entrapped by um, a building that's been blown up by an ID, for instance, and in a hostile situation, they need to get the patient out of there. And there have been people who've had field amputations um, in the battlefield space with some ketamine. But the um, induction of an unstable patient, I think, is um, a very important aspect for ketamine. And um, in a head injured patient, for instance, um, that needs um, um, intubation and uh, anaesthesia. Um, some, some of these really shocked patients are maximally sympathetically uh, driven and so giving them an opiate or some other drug that actually drops their sympathetic drive is actually quite dangerous. So a small dose of ketamine is actually very useful. And the other thing about ketamine is that in, uh, in these young patients, I find young, fit, healthy men, mainly with orthopaedic injuries, they often have, you fill them full of opiates and they um, are still in pain, but their respiratory rate is eight. And so in those patients, I find a small dose of ketamine really just uh, hits things on the head and, and an, obviously a um, optional ketamine infusion as well. So I think analgesia is important. Um, this is actually... Um, just a moulage um, uh, traumatic amputation. It's amazing how, what you can actually do in training with um, good props. This is an amputee actor. Um, but um, regional um, analgesia is obviously very important in these traumatic wounds because um, from the point of injury back to evacuation to a rehabilitation centre, maybe hours, maybe days. And so um, managing the pain for these casualties is actually um, very important. And so for an upper limb traumatic amputation, you've got the options of an interscalene or supraclavicular, and obviously for a, a lower limb, you've got the femoral and sciatic. But of course, with uh, regional analgesia, you've got the, the liability of having some equipment. We do them with ultrasound these days, and there are portable ultrasounds um, around, obviously, but, uh, and on the HMAS Canberra, you would have, but you may not have it in all of the forward um, military facilities, and you have to obviously have and a, a catheter that you can put in and some sort of pump to reliably inject the local anaesthetic. I find there's a lot of um, fancy catheters on the market, but an epidural catheter um, is actually uh, fine for most things. But of course, there's a training liability. Not everyone is actually being trained to put in these nerve blocks, so that is, um, that is something that is important. But it is actually very important for, to reduce the likelihood of PTSD in these uh, multiply injured casualties. Um, and surprisingly, infection in these dirty battlefield wounds with regional catheters have actually not been as, um, as important as, as, um, or as debilitating as you would expect. So I think um, if, if you do have all of the bells and whistles in a fancy operating theatre, like you would have in a tertiary hospital, well then that's great. But the, the challenge of military medicine is, I think, when you don't have the resources, you're in a more austere environment, you don't have you know, a red button that you can press on the wall, you don't have oxygen outlets coming out of the wall, and you are in an austere environment and um, you don't have anyone to call on and you've, you're using things, you're doing treatment via headlamp. So I think that this photo actually just demonstrates some of the challenges. I mean, you can do anaesthesia in all sorts of aspects. I used to think when I first started anaesthesia that you actually need a fancy anaesthetic machine to deliver anaesthesia, and of course that's actually not true. This is a picture of a um, field anaesthesia um, um, device. There's actually compressed oxygen there. So a lot of the times when you're doing anaesthesia in a, in a military setting, the questions are, do you have compressed oxygen? And that, I think, is something that it's, it's one of the resources that you need to, to think about because that is a short supply. Like shipping oxygen cylinders you know, to a foreign country may not be necessarily easy and it may not be in um, abundant supply. So this, this is a machine with a plenum vaporiser which uses uh, compressed oxygen. But of course, if you don't have compressed oxygen, you can still deliver anaesthetic agents via a drawover um, draw over anaesthetic device, and, and we have these in the military as well. The other way of doing anaesthesia is do you have inhaled gases or do we have 
intravenous um, medication, obviously if you've got inhaled volatile agents, you need to have either a draw over or a plenum vaporizer. But if you um, have got propofol, then you can deliver anesthesia intravenously and you don't need all the, the anesthetic machine. But then what do you do if you don't have a syringe driver? I mean, in, in uh, modern medicine, we actually use syringe drivers to deliver accurate doses of intravenous anesthesia, but uh, that may not be the case. So um, there are lots of little recipes around, and this is one such recipe that you can use for um, more austere environments where you don't have the resources. And this is a picture of a dialer flow, which is actually, it's, it's um, a simple device, which is more accurate than counting drips. Um, and you actually dial up the, the um, mills that you want per hour on the little um, dialer flow. It's a single use disposable, it's cheap, it's actually quite a good little device. And you actually just put your concoction in the bag of saline and, um, and uh, there's a little recipe for you if you don't have any of the fancy gear. If you want to do some procedural sedation, you can just put some really good stuff in a syringe and actually just give boluses um, for short-acting painful, painful things. Now, the other thing I think is um, a, a big factor of military stuff is if you, if, you're not, if you don't have all of the gear in the operating theatre, you may actually, you may not have, the HMAS Canberra may be a day or two away. So in which case, these are some of the aspects that need consideration. These, this is an example of a kit some of the Americans use, you know, when they go out into a more austere environment. You know, we've, we've got these ventilators, you know, it's not a gas-driven ventilator, it's got long battery life, very rugged. This is actually a, a small oxygen, um, the O2 pack, a little oxygen generator where you can, once you've activated it, it will give you 25 minutes of oxygen at six litres a minute. Um, so there's a lot of... Um, different um, portable type things that you, you may have access to in a more austere environment. And so these are, the, the, one of the things that we think about in a military is how to get more intensive care out into the field and, and um, the concepts of delivering ICU in, a, in an, a situation where you don't have all the fancy resources. Um, this is, um, an example of a way you can actually store blood. How do you store blood if you don't have a reliable refrigeration system? Well, um, this is a Pelican make this and um, you can actually freeze the uh, compartments um, beforehand and once it's frozen you can put four units of blood in there and you can keep it for four days. The other thing about um, battlefield military medicine is also the uh, technology and as technology increases you know it's it's really great to sort of keep abreast of what else is out there and so you guys may have seen the intra uh, the sternal fast the uh, sternal intraosseous um, uh, devices um, this is a uh, this is uh, the extat which is um, just recently uh, been licensed in America and it's just basically uh, sponges that you inject into a cavity to try and um, pack a wound. Um, some other things, obviously when you're trying to carry stuff out into the field you may actually, size is important, so um, you've got a portable um, um, IV fluid heater there, you've got um, a little ventilator which only weighs 1.2 kilos, so there's, there's lots of new equipment that is constantly getting generated. And I just lastly want to finish with um, telemedicine, which is an issue that we deal with in, in a dislocated environment, such as, um, you know, a remote military setting. Because you may not have all of the specialists at your fingertips, and uh, being able to ring home and actually get proper advice is actually a very important part, I think, of military medicine. And um, this is just one device um, that um, is is on the market where every it's a it's a vital signs monitor but you can attach a video larynx scope you can attach an ultrasound to that and everything that comes up on the screen is actually transmitted to you know securely to someone back home and so there could be a, a specialist or a doctor at the other end guiding somebody through a space like that and uh, for example, this is me learning to do burr holes at a course. Um, but I mean, there are there are doctors even in rural communities that have actually been um, found to be in a situation where they've got to do life-saving procedures without the nece you know, with with guidance electronically. So um, that is also another consideration of military medicine anaesthesia. 
Thank you. Thanks. So our patients continue their, their journey and they move into the intensive care uh, on Canberra or in Canberra and uh, Captain Mackey will talk to us about the ICU uh, and their care in that environment. Jeez, thank you, sir. Here's a picture of the ICU on HMS Canberra. And I think our session really aligns well with the previous pandemic um, discussion that occurred before. And hopefully you're seeing some really, I guess, repeating themes through the sessions. And um, as we arrive in the intensive care, I thought it'd be worthwhile discussing not so much the patient management, because how we treat a head injured patient or someone with trauma on a ship in an intensive care unit is not, the key priorities are not distinctly different from what they would be at the Royal Melbourne or the Princess Alexandra Hospital. But I think it's worthwhile talking about some of the team factors, the workforce issues, and those challenges that exist day to day managing a patient in an ICU, because all the exciting stuff's happened, people have been moved, but as we know, that tidal wave hits and they stay in ICU, and there's some really unique things about that experience and management that I think it's, it's worth a touch on. So look, um, for the most part, our experience in intensive care is that we have a daily routine. Like you come to work, you check your roster, you do your allocations, but um, the picture I've got here is of em empty beds. And for the initial part of an operational deployment like this, that you may not actually have patients in the ICU. So what do you do? Well, I think Dan touched on that we spend a lot of time thinking that our main goal is to improve the outcomes um, for our patients. We have an attitude that we think about the most likely events and we look at the most dangerous. We spend a lot of time preparing for these things. But overarching that is that we're in an environment that's pretty uncertain. We have a lot of other responsibilities that aren't necessarily apparent when you, when you describe yourself as a medical officer or a nursing officer. And I'd like to touch on those further. So when we are told we're deploying, we inform our team. It's really important that we, we start preparing and thinking about the environment we're going into. And so, again, in Dan's session, he touched on that pre-planning. So in our critical care teams, our intensivists, anaesthetists, and medics, we spend a lot of time rehearsing and practicing. Even before we go on operations, we may embed ourselves in a civilian setting, and some hospitals may have had the, um, I say, privilege or honour or, or disaster of having military <laughs> people come in and work with you and try and um, refine our skills and, and, and tweak things. So we spend a lot of time thinking about those things. And for those of you who have been on a P&O cruise and had the, um, the terrible episode of you know, an upset stomach, we think about what would it be like to have um, a massive outbreak of barley belly or, or, or other sort of infectious diseases. How are we going to manage that? And we think about, the, the, I guess, the environment and threats uh, and the common ones we try and think about are, are the trauma, the, the, the bullets, the broken bones and the burns. We try and prepare for all situations. And I think we have a a real culture of preparedness, and I think that was highlighted in the pandemic talk, that we spent a lot of time in simulation training. We spent a lot of time sitting down with a notepad, looking at what might occur, and then we walk it through. I think that was again highlighted the importance of when you walk through from the ship through ED up to ICU, and you work out how you're going to move things, um, how you're going to transfer information and paperwork, where you're going to get your resources, blood and medications from, it starts to flag some issues because in our teams, we only have limited staff. We don't have the ability to call in agency nurses, call in offline nurses. It's a real challenge. So we, we're guided by, I guess, those principles of disaster management that we want to manage the risks initially, get our patients through, through that episode, get them, um, you know, so they survive that initial injury, and then we try and get them to recover. Um, if we can do that on ship and get them back to work, that's our goal. But if it means that the recovery is going to be better managed back at on shore to tertiary or, or, or um, larger facility, that's our goal. We're in an environment where, um, again, we have, have to develop flexible models of how to manage our patients. Our workforce is uniquely different, just from the fact that um, we have, um, once we leave shore, we only have certain people. Um, and those people, um, you know, we, we prepare and train, but we're heavily um, guided by, I guess, our civilian setting and our qualifications. So we expect all our nurses to have a postgraduate qualification in intensive care or critical care. A lot of our nurses, though, are, um, and team members are double-hatted. They, they might be ED positions. They might have experience in anaesthetics. Um, um, they might have done some remote work in, in um, obstetric and, and uh, emergencies. We also have a workforce that... Um, 
again, is different. We have our, our medics, which was touched on with Dan, but so they're enrolled nurses qualified with APRA. Um, but we have to spend a lot of time realising that if that's our workforce and we have to work as a team, how are we going to meet those goal standards of one-on-one -on -one nursing when things get busy? And remember, when you leave the bed space, you have to eat, sleep, you've got to have other duties on ship. How do we manage that? So we have to take some, I guess, some leadership in our training and preparation of our staff and spend a lot of time um, on ship and before deployment, preparing our medics to recognise life-threatening issues, understand the priorities of management, have the confidence to speak up when they don't know something. And also, as, as nurses, having the confidence to speak up when you're feeling outside your scope, when you're used to hitting that red button, as you mentioned before, and getting extra assistance, what do I do? So I think we try to spend a lot of time in that simulation developing a culture where we can talk through problems openly, have people speak up if they are unclear of, of the goals and outcomes and try and develop some really effective habits of how we're going to manage our patients. It's been mentioned in literature that um, with that changing workforce it creates challenges and stress. You know, we have um, the focus is on patient and best care delivery. So when you're having a mixed workforce um, and people are working in, in various um, you know, uh, other roles, which means you're not getting eight hours sleep of a night. You're sleeping in a noisy environment, um, hot environment. Um, you may have other responsibilities which require your attention. So when you bring that back to the workforce in, in the intensive care environment, um, we have to accept that we're not going to be operating um, at optimal levels. And so we have to work around having, I guess, more flexible strategies in how we work and rest. Um, we use some different models from the mining industry on, on having short breaks and short rest breaks that people can come back and refresh, knowing that you may have to work six, seven days straight. You may have to work on a 12-hour roster with being on call as well. And that environment of always knowing that you're going to be on call um, does create a certain um, pressure on you uh, professionally. Um, but I guess we, we know that we're part of a team that supports and can work um, you know, for an outcome for our patients, that we find that that, that bonds and gets you that focus to, to get through. The expanded roles are pretty, pretty common for, for nurses in that environment where, again, um, we may have um, a plan and strategy for managing the, the pain um, and sedation of our patients, which is different to our protocols back home. We're not used to having um, certain battery life and certain resources. So we think about that if I've only got 50 IV lines available, how am I going to go through my resources? If I only have so much oxygen on ship, how are we going to manage our patients? So that constant reflection of, is this the best management? Are we achieving our goals with that notion of the resources we have and the staff we have um, pervade our thinking? And again, those challenges are real and we can't hide from it that often the workload environment impact on um, the team and when patients are here for one day, two days, three days, it starts to accumulate. So again with that pandemic discussion we talked about um, how do we do, how do we manage that. I think it's really important that as intensive care nurses and in military as health professionals we, we work hard at understanding the importance of rest and sleep, nutrition, diet, having um, a chance to verbalise when you're not, not, not struggling while at work and having an outlet to um, to step away and come back to the work workplace because it is challenging. And if we've got soldiers on the bed, they're unwell, that um, there's a personal impact on that. We see that we see that they're young, healthy and fit. You hear their stories. Their mates come in and tell you that you know he's got a girlfriend back home, he loves his dogs, and we have connect with our patients. So in many ways, um, there's a real risk that we get that compassion fatigue in that environment because it's in a little funnel. You're in this little... Um, tight-knit unit and so we, we, it's a real challenge for us as, as in that critical care team to um, be close to our patients, think about the management um, and so there's a lot of emphasis that we spend on, you know, I guess looking after each other, having good relationships out of work, um, being open about how we're feeling and I think that's a, a culture that's been developed in, in defence, particularly in health, where we recognise those stresses are unique um, but it's effective to pick them up and recognise them. In my own experience, when you're working um, with colleagues who you don't see functioning well, it's been these experiences in the military which have um, highlighted that it's important to touch people on the shoulder and get them to have a break, get them to, to debrief, um, but knowing that they have to come back to work and, and contribute again. 
the responsibility and autonomy, um, and I've got the little picture of the elephant, my daughter loves elephants, that that's a rewarding experience. You know, getting up a hill and, and seeing yourself work through in this environment um, is a real um, humbling experience. You know, you've grown from it, that your colleagues, your intensivists, you know, allow you to, you know, have a plan, work in that environment um, with limited supervision, um, gives you a sense that you're actually, um, you know, you're practising at a more advanced level. And through the history of nursing, particularly um, uh, back to World War One, nurses have, have, have taken that role and sort of moved forward and, and taken those advanced practice skills. So again, it highlights that we spend a lot of time in our simulation training trying to pick up those key issues in our management of patients. So when we're stuck in these environments where we don't have a lot of supervision, we, um, we feel comfortable to manage it. And finally, again, the, the, the notion that we're in a limited setting. We have limited staff, stuff and resources, and that it's really important that um, we consider where's the best place for these patients. So on a ship, we can't just keep filling up. So even with these two admissions, we'd be reaching crisis point, where we'd have to start thinking, if we have any more events onshore, what are we going to do? So the back end is always um, something we probably don't think often about as nurses. And as an ICU team, it's, it's critical we consider um, what's the best place for this patient. So I guess the notion of having a transfer should always be a planned, calm event. Um, we've got to manage the risks as a, as a whole team and understand the importance of um, um, you know, why we're, doing, why we're doing the move and um, the benefit or risks of doing that. We touched on the notion of telemedicine before, that often we may not have the resources available to, um, to diagnose and get the best assessment and we may have to use um, our uh, offshore support to guide us in those decisions. But it's a balance and I think too on a ship, moving someone to CT packed up around corners, um, it's very hard to manage an airway ahead look at your monitoring, have two people pushing a trolley. So just the logistics of that um, is something you wouldn't consider as being an issue in a tertiary hospital where you might have five people, you know, a lift that's double sized, you know, doors can shut, you can access the CT easily enough. Um, these are real issues on a ship or, or any other setting that we might have um, an ICU patient in defence. And finally, I just thought it's, um, to give you a sense of all the um, the heaviness of managing these patients, that there's a real reward to it, that often um, why the ICU team um, and the health team on these um, deployments are so successful is because we, we develop that loyalty and friendship. And often it's developed in the civilian setting, we work together professionally, and then we step into other uniforms and, and uh, have that relationship. It's this notion too that we often have two families. We have a family that's green or white or blue, and that um, when we're having our soldiers or our, um, our patients admitted, we feel a connection to them and you want to serve and, and um, provide them with the best possible care. So for me, I thought I'd touch on just those experiences have really shaped, um, um, shaped me and I think too, it's been a real um, you know, highlight in my professional career to have the experiences working in intensive care and in the, um, I guess, defence health. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. I thought uh, we'd pause the scenario now and uh, reflect probably on the last 15 years. I look up and down this panel and I think probably each person here has deployed maybe two or three, uh, four times overseas to various conflicts in the last decade. And Colonel Reid is going to spend some time um, consolidating the lessons that we've learnt in the last 15 years of war and what we've studied. Uh, what still needs to be studied and how we can uh, move forward and take these lessons and not forget them. So thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Anthony. So you've heard a lot and, and very eloquently uh, about uh, the, the way we do things and, and how we do things, and I guess it falls now to me to describe to you some of the research that underpins why we do some of those things. Um, Conflict, as many of you, of course, will have recognised over the centuries, has been a catalyst for the advance in uh, military, in, in healthcare in general, not just in military healthcare. But in the last 15 years, I, I suppose in parallel with a, a renewed focus on uh, research rigour and in particular an epidemiological approach to research in our global healthcare system, um, we've really seen the benefits of that from the, the military perspective as well. And a whole new field of research has emerged called combat casualty care, uh, and, and it's that that I'm going to describe to you uh, this morning. Uh, 
or this afternoon. So I'm just going to throw you a, a, a random selection of studies that have emanated from the military environment that drive some of the things that you've heard uh, so far today. So here's a study from uh, the US military, the uh, US Joint Theatre Trauma System uh, Combat Casualty Care Database that has uh, around 55,000 casualties in it accumulated over the last 15 years. Uh, and it, uh, the investigators in this study set out to examine what happened when the goal of uh, care changed in around uh, 2009, 2010 from aiming to get uh, casualty on the battlefield to a surgical facility within 90 minutes to changing it to uh, that goal being uh, within 60 minutes. And uh, I guess there's a couple of things to note here. One is that when Donald Rumsfeld says that something should change, it, it actually changed. So the proportion of people who met that performance metric after the introduction uh, of that mandate uh, was, was you know, dramatic. Um, so a very high proportion uh, very rapidly met that uh, metric. And, and these investigators were able to show that uh, in concert with that, uh, the mortality of those casualties uh, reduced, in a sense validating the concept of the, the golden hour. That study also showed something that I guess might have been intuitively obvious to anyone who'd worked in a civilian healthcare service, but uh, I guess less so in the military where we often focus on very light deployable hospitals, as you've, uh, as you've heard, uh, that for the most critically wounded patients, these group here with an injury severity score of greater than 25, the mortality was substantially less if you were taken to a larger combat support hospital compared to a, a forward surgical team. So I put this up not at all to uh, diminish uh, any of the uh, stories that you've heard uh, to date about the way that we are able to project surgical care forward. Sometimes that is very necessary. But I, I think the point to take from this is that we're a self-learning organisation and we're able to look at the results when we do this versus when we do that uh, and to adjust our, um, our, our plan for the provision of healthcare support in the deployed environment accordingly. Uh, and indeed, this has uh, played on the mind of many health planners since its publication last year. Uh, a slightly earlier study, but one, uh, again, that's uh, both influenced civilian and military thinking about how we do uh, trauma resuscitation is, uh, is this, which came from a comparison of the uh, trauma databases of the United Kingdom and the United States. And they looked at uh, the pre-hospital care capability that was put forward into the battlefield uh, in comparison, again, in comparing those two nations. And so here we've got injury severity score of patients versus mortality. Uh, and as you might expect, in the most severely injured patients, it didn't matter whether you were uh, transported by uh, a, a very capable uh, Chinook-based emergency physician-led uh, resuscitation capability or whether you were transported by the United States capability, which at that stage constituted uh, just a pre-hospital medic. Uh, in other words, if you were very severely wounded, your mortality was very high regardless. And equally, if you were not very severely wounded, there was no difference in mortality outcomes. But for the group of people who had, you might say, the, the largest preventable rate of mortality, that the uh, intermediate injury severity score, it was demonstrated that the, the MERT, the Medical Emergency Response Team, the British approach approach to this, the emergency physician-led team, had a, a lower mortality than did um, projecting forward a more austere capability. And again, this has informed uh, the way we project uh, emergency medicine onto the battlefield. You've heard about tourniquets. We, we don't just put tourniquets on. They've been subjected to some uh, research. It's difficult to do randomised control trials. In fact, it's almost impossible to do randomised controlled trials in the deployed environment, but we do collect data and to the degree that you can uh, draw conclusions from observational data, we've, we've done just that. So here's a, a US study by uh, what many consider as the, the father of the tourniquet, John Cray, Colonel, Colonel Cray from the United States uh, Army Institute of Surgical Research, uh, demonstrating uh, in this case uh, that if the tourniquet was applied pre-hospital compared to if it was applied in the hospital, uh, the mortality was substantially less. I guess you might say circumstantial evidence, but probably the best we have, and I guess goes intuitively with also our understanding of uh, pre-hospital hemorrhage control. Uh, if you're talking about landmark studies that the military has contributed to general medical care, it'd be difficult to go past this one. 
Uh, this uh, study was done in a combat hospital in, in Iraq in the mid-2000s, uh, before many of the uh, data systems that we have uh, now were computerised. So I, I know Phil Spinella quite well. I consider him a friend. He's now a paediatric intensivist in the, in the US, but he's described to me how at the end of every day their, their job as intensivist was to sit down on the Excel spreadsheet and to record the number of units of plasma and, and red cells that had been transfused to the patients that had been admitted to the hospital that day. And they were able to demonstrate from that very, uh, you might say, rudimentary database, uh, this finding that uh, a high ratio of plasma to red cells was associated with a substantial improvement in mortality. Now, from a scientific point of view, we've now all come to realise that this is a, you might say, deeply flawed study, but it was the first study to, to really, I guess, change our thinking, which prior to this had been largely a crystalloid first and then followed by packed red cell uh, transfusion strategy. And it's led the United States military to go on and do much more rigorous scientific studies such as this, uh, the proper randomised control trial comparing uh, blood transfusion ratios, all done uh, entirely on uh, military funding of research. We've also looked at uh, uh, observational work with uh, uh, blood transfusion research. So here's a study that uh, many will uh, recall being quoted uh, to support the uh, hypothesised superiority of transfusing fresh whole blood as opposed to reconstituted uh, blood, if, if you like, from uh, red cells, uh, packed red blood cells, plasma and platelets. And uh, in this study, Phil Spinella was able to show a very substantial mortality benefit uh, in people who happened to be, so not randomised, but happened to be transfused uh, 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 fresh whole blood compared to component therapy. Now, again, we recognise that this is a highly confounded study. I'm not at all standing here telling you that this is evidence for the use of fresh whole blood, but it's difficult to do studies in fresh whole blood outside the military environment because of the logistic difficulties of doing that in the civilian environment. And it's from this type of study that we might then derive sufficient equipoise and rationale for funding for a trial in a civilian environment of, of fresh whole blood. The Australian Defence Force is no stranger to, to research work in blood. So here's our, our CLIP uh, study, the study of cryopreserved platelets, which we're uh, doing in conjunction with the Australian Red Cross Blood Service, a pilot study to start with in 90 cardiac surgical patients. Now uh, up to five hospitals, I hope with the addition of Auckland at the end of this year. Uh, and we think that this is a technology that holds equal promise for, uh, for the civilian blood uh, community as it, and, and hospitals as it does uh, promise for defence uh, with uh, the underlying hypothesis that uh, cryopreserved platelets, that is platelets that are stored at minus 80 degrees for up to two years, uh, might be at least as efficacious and safe as our conventional platelets stored for only five days. And, and if indeed we're able to show that through this trial program, not only would we have this technology available within our defence force, but we would, uh, we, we think, revolutionise the supply of blood products or platelets in particular throughout our civilian healthcare system. We've done research on topical haemostatic agents. The uh, agent of choice in the Australian Defence Force is shown there, the combat gauze. Um, again, a little difficult to do randomised control trials in soldiers, but uh, a, an extensive uh, preclinical research program uh, done with partners in the United States and in the United Kingdom, uh, looking at uh, efficacy, safety and so on of these, of these products, which are now coming into civilian pre-hospital practice. Uh, we've also looked at pre, uh, parenteral uh, haemostatic agents. You've heard tranexamic acid mentioned before. And of course, the trial that everybody knows about tranexamic acid, the CRASH-2 study, 20,000 patients. Um, but with some questions around the applicability of that study to a developed world trauma practice. So here's some observational data that emanates from uh, the, uh, what was the Role 3 uh, combat hospital uh, run by the United Kingdom uh, with the assistance of the United States in Helmand province in Afghanistan, showing that if you, if you happen to receive, so a non-randomised controlled study, but if you happen to receive tranexamic acid compared to not receiving tranexamic acid, your probability of survival, survival was substantially greater. Um, there are reasons to be concerned about uh, the validity of that study in our context, and we've written about this, uh, and, and indeed we're one of the collaborators in the PATCH study, uh, which many of you will be familiar with around Australia and, and New Zealand, uh, looking at uh, the efficacy and safety of pre-hospital tranexamic acid uh, in the civilian community, whereby we hope to answer this question around tranexamic acid uh, definitively.
We, we contribute to guidelines in the military. So uh, as many of you will know, in uh, around April of this year, the uh, Australian Resuscitation Council and the New Zealand Council on Resuscitation uh, uh, published its first ever guideline on traumatic cardiac arrest, largely based on military understandings of how these patients are quite different to the medical causes uh, of cardiac arrest, prioritising restoration of circulating blood volume opening of the airway, decompressing tension pneumothoraces and, and decompressing uh, pericardial tamponade in preference to doing you might, uh, what you might imagine are, uh, we now know, ineffective uh, chest compressions of an empty heart, uh, defibrillating a heart that has no capacity to pump blood if there's no blood in it, uh, and questioning the relevance of adrenaline until the circulating blood volume has been restored. So I guess you know, that's of interest in a, in a general sense, but I draw your attention to the fact that that's, uh, in a sense, a contribution of the Australian Defence Force to our civilian community. So if we were to try and quantify all of that, here's a nice study that's shown that the bulk of research that's gone on in the last few years uh, has been largely critical care focused. Um, the United States in particular has uh, invested an enormous amount of money in this type of research, but uh, so indeed has uh, as the Australian Defence Force uh, in my position, a slightly lesser amount of money in funding me, but still, um, we're, we're nonetheless a contributor to this global research enterprise, um, which is very much showing uh, benefit in terms of number of publications. And there's a really nice analysis showing a, a six-time increase uh, since 2001 uh, in the number of publications related to uh, trauma and military medicine, which I think is a, a nice metric on which to end. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Now, for the last uh, two speakers, we'll return to our scenario. And as has been mentioned along the way, that in order to keep the flow of patients going and the capability of a facility, the patients need to be uh, taken out of that facility and moved on. And uh, the conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq, those patients were strategically moved across the globe and brought uh, home to Australia. And we've gained a lot of experience in the last 10, 15 years in this uh, area, and I can now turn to my Air Force colleagues and ask them uh, to talk us through some of the aspects of this care. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anthony. I guess um, to start off with, um, you've probably heard that whatever happens to a casualty in a battle zone is that they go through a number of medical facilities. It's unlike civilian trauma where generally people might go to a country hospital and then to a major trauma centre and that's where they stay, or sometimes they go straight to the trauma centre. But you can understand that, you know, the initial care that Dan described, buddy care and self-care, um, they then have to get out of that battle zone somehow. And generally, we tend to use rotary wing um, uh, assets. Um, they're highly manoeuvrable, um, they're rapidly deployed, um, and they can get patients uh, out of a quite a sticky situation quite quickly. We really want to get that patient to some definitive surgery and, oh sorry, some de, um, damage, damage control, control <laughs> surgery and damage control resuscitation. Thanks, Beck. Um, it's been a long week. Um, <clears throat> And actually, so for those that work in major trauma centres, what you might find is similar to what happens in the military. Those patients initially go um, just to control major haemorrhage, um, and then they need to go back to intensive care to be warmed, manage the coagulopathy and all of those sorts of things. So that's what we do. So they've come straight to the Canberra. They've, um, those that needed uh, surgery have had surgery. Um, and, um, and then, of course, um, as you've heard from, from Ben, there's a limited intensive care holding. We have to get them off the ship. So the only way we can get people off the ship, again, is by helicopter. So you saw they arrived onto the ship by helicopter. We have to get them off the ship. Because if we have a holding, whether in fact it's on a ship or in a land-based facility, we only have a certain number of intensive care beds. If it's going to be clear that we can't get those patients better, and, and return to the front line to contribute to the action. And if you're in intensive care, that's going to be pretty unlikely. It's a bottleneck. We need to get those patients out of there as quickly as possible. So this, this photo, in fact, is a, a photo of, of uh, an AME team member with multiple casualties transferred on an ambulance bus. So you can see the number of propacks there in the photo. They're basically all stringed up on a specially designed um, bus. Um, to try and get all the casualties out to an aircraft in a fairly timely manner. So um, this is, in fact, an Australian uh, C-17 
Um, so it's uh, an AM bus that's being backed up to the back of that C-17. Um, and so again, we want to minimise the amount of time that those aircraft are on the ground. Sometimes, in fact, you know, airfields, we're trying to put in a safer environment, but sometimes, in fact, those airfields can be at risk as well. So we don't want to have the aircraft on the ground any longer than possible. The other thing is that these aircraft are often multitasked. So often we have to have some way of um, reconfiguring this aircraft. We don't have dedicated uh, medical evacuation aircraft in the Air Force. We don't have that luxury. So these are all multi-tasked, generally cargo aircraft. So they're often full of cargo and troops, and then we reconfigure them uh, when they're on the ground to accept patients. So this is in the inside of a C-17. I'm sorry, it's not a very big photo, um, but you can see how many patients that are all lined up there on the aircraft. And then when we get uh, to the other end, we can offload them. And we don't generally have, um, in fact, we, I don't think we have, we don't have any ambuses in the military anymore, but I think there might be one in Darwin for the National Critical Care and um, Trauma uh, Response Centre. And then we transfer them usually to a civilian facility. So with all of this, it needs to be controlled from a control centre. So all of these patient movements have to be well and truly tracked. We have to know where every person is, whether it will be, in fact, be an AME team member or the patient. You can imagine if, you, if you've got a, a relative and they want to know where their, where their loved one is somewhere along the chain, well, I don't know, they're, they're somewhere there. I'm sure we'll find them eventually. That's not going to work. It's like, and we don't have ID bands, um, but it, we're coming into some more technology about how we can you know, track these patients? How can we move the files with these patients? You know, much better than paper. What we really want to ensure is that we get the right patient to the right place, the right time, um, needing, getting the right care. I think that um, Ma'am will agree with me and any of um, any people in the Air Force that have done aeromedical evacuations of Australian people will agree that it's an absolute honour and a pleasure to be able to bring our Australian soldiers home. So this would be a similar situation that we would be honoured to be able to do this job and make sure that we give them the best care that they deserve. So moving on to the next slide, we'd like to discuss with you the kind of capabilities that we have in the in the Air Force to be able to move our patients on what's called a strategic AME. So our strategic AME is moving them from that area of operations that we've been conducting operations in back to our home base in Australia. There are two aircraft that we use. One is the C-130 Hercules and that can take up to 94 <coughs> litres. Please note that 94 <coughs> litres in a C-130 would be stacked five high which obviously if we have some critically unwell patients or any unwell patient you wouldn't want them on a very top litter right up the top, you'd have to climb up to treat them. So that is extremely rare and unusual and wouldn't generally be done. There is ICU capability, however it's, it's quite heavy and a little bit cumbersome. There's no intrinsic oxygen. Um, it does have uh, a decent range but it not as large as the C-17 and it would need to do some jumps if, it, if our uh, destination or our, our origin and destination are quite far apart. If you have a look, the comparison is the C-17 aircraft, which actually has intrinsic O2. So it's got piped oxygen, it's got five intensive care bays, it has um, electrical supply, and it has a much further range and a higher speed. So we'll be able to get there, uh, to get to our location with less jumps and faster. So if we have a look at the medical capability on the C-17, so the C-17 as a particular aircraft was always developed with medical evacuation in mind, and that's why they've got intrinsic oxygen. So how do we get lots of oxygen on the plane? Well, the best way we can do that is by <coughs> using liquid oxygen. So one of the speakers um, earlier in this conference mentioned uh, liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is in fact used on all the commercial jets. So if, there's a, if there is an, um, an emergency and those oxygen masks drop down, um, the crew go on their own liquid oxygen. So one litre of gaseous oxygen um, is more than 800 litres of, one litre of liquid oxygen is more than 800 litres of gaseous oxygen. So a very small 
um, container has a huge capacity <coughs> to then supply uh, oxygen to a lot of patients. So for us, we've only got oxygen outlets on one side of the aircraft, that's just the way it was developed, but we've got two large liquid oxygen tanks just for medical use in the back of the aircraft. So the crew have their own. The problem is that um, the outlets, of course, it's, in, it's an American designed aircraft, um, and uh, so all of the fittings are American. So for those people who've ever worked outside Australia, unfortunately we've got a certain oxygen uh, fitting, uh, which is very different to the American uh, oxygen fittings. So for us, because we work between the Australian and the American aircraft, we have to have two sets of hoses that have two different lots of fittings. So we, all of our ventilators, we have to change over the hoses from when we come from often you know, cylinders onto the aircraft, swap a different hose onto the aircraft, and at the end we have to do a different hose to put onto oxygen cylinder in Australia to then transfer them back to another hospital. So there's all of those sorts of things that we really need to keep in mind. So we've also got domestic um, electrical outlets, so similar things. So we have to have um, equipment. Some equipment can in fact do dual voltage, so 110, 60 hertz American um, and 240, 60 hertz Australian, but they have, a, they have a different plug than what we do. Some um, medical equipment is able to be switched between the two, some isn't. So some of it in fact will run on, on um, drawing power on the aircraft, but then we'll just run on battery when we get home. Some of them in fact will run on international plugs to plug into Australian supply to recharge when we get home. There is an inherent stretch capability on this aircraft at all times. So we can basically set up to take nine patients so if, if for some reason the aircraft happens to be in a, in, a, in a place and suddenly we've got a short need to basically transfer patients out, basically we've, we can put, pull the frames off the side of the aircraft and we can convert it in air um, in about 15 minutes to take on nine patients um, and with all the electrical and oxygen connections as well. We're also quite lucky because we like doing things a little bit more comfortably um, as we get a bit further down the chain. And we actually, um, if we have a, a known AME, we ask for them to install a comfort pallet. And on that is um, some fridges, some ovens. So you can imagine it's a long flight, 16 hour flight. So um, the crew de definitely like to have hot meals. Um, but it also puts in additional toilets. So you can imagine the number of people on the back of the plane and only having one aircraft toilet up the front that's not going to be enough. So um, having that is quite nice. Definitely um, this aircraft is a lot nicer to travel in. It's a lot quieter. They can climate control it down the end and you can see there's a lot more working space than there is um, on the C-130 Herc. <clears throat> I think that um, this really leads into, into that planning about how we're going to execute this mission. And part of that is, is setting up the team. I will point out here that there are also other considerations when we're talking about switching oxygen. We need to really think through how we're going to execute this. And that goes all the way down to the team doing the mission. So we need to think about whether or not we do have additional packs on board. Earlier on we did talk about the fact that we would be taking diplomats um, or civilians. We may need to roll that aircraft so we have the aeromedical com component at one end of the aircraft and civilian passengers at the other end. And that makes it complicated for us. As medical professionals we need to think about how we're going to set our aircraft up to be able to facilitate that. We also might be taking other equipment um, throughout that journey. Our pre-flight checks are extremely important. We have somebody coming along with an abdominal wound. We need to make sure that he has a nasogastric tube in and we need to make sure we've got antiemetics. We need to make sure we've got everything that we need to support that on our mission. So, we, so as a team, we need to be thinking through the clinical care of our patients and making sure that we've got the right equipment to be able to do the right job. And it all needs to be planned and we need to be thinking about contingencies and speaking to the crew at all times as a team to make sure the captain knows what are our contingencies if things do go wrong. Mm. So we need to think again about if the air, uh, equipment can't be plugged into the aircraft, how many batteries, spare batteries do we actually need to, to carry, um, what things can be charged in flight. There's some equipment that we can't use on ascent and descent but we can use in flight. So we have to be very aware of all of that. Um, what we, we basically need to do is 
is provide everything required for that patient, if we need to do any dressings in flight and all those sorts of things, is to surround them with all of those requirements. So there's quite a lot for us to think about. And I guess we do have um, some checklists that help us because I guess this is a very stressing, stressful environment um, and uh, not only for the patients but for us as well as crew and we're often doing many, many, many hours in, in flying. I don't know about all of you but I certainly get fatigued even just flying in a, in a commercial liner and not working. So if you're actually working for any, any length of time in the back of, back of the plane, it's, it's really quite tiring. So we need to figure that in as well. How do we figure enough crew rest? Do we need more than one crew? Um, so that we can swap over after a certain number of hours. In a large mission like this, we'd very likely have someone <coughs> like Ma'am as a mission commander on headset speaking to the captain. We, that person would be responsible for managing the team and the, clinic, the clinicians on the floor to make sure that they are looked after as well as the patients. So for us, it's really important you can see that the AME team, I mean, the reason that Becca and I are um, up here presenting together is because Beck is permanent Air Force and I'm the specialist um, from the reserve. And we do work really closely together as an integrated team. So in our training, what we need to do in terms of for the critical care specialists, who really, we want to bring their critical care skills onto the military aircraft and understand the aviation medicine type aspects for managing patients on these long haul missions. Very different to short, uh, short duration rotary wing uh, AME, which is um, what a lot of uh, happens in Australia. Or only managing one patient at a time. So we need to, to think about how do we safely work around the aircraft? Because remember, we're often walking across the airfield. We have to be aware of what other aircraft are going on. If there's an emergency in the air, we have to be able to open up all the safety exits, um, a bit like, you know, the the uh, flight stewards do on the commercial jets. So we, we get training with how to do that, how to activate the, the life rafts and, um, and the ropes. We need to know, as specialists even, how to configure the aircraft for aeromedical evacuation. And I think you could probably tell from all the speakers today, because we're you know, such small teams, it's really all hands on deck. So there's no one that just says, oh, sorry, I'm the critical care person. I'll just sit down, let me know when you need me. It's all hands on deck, and we need to, need to get that um, you know, very clear. Um, we do work um, closely together, and so we train together as a team. So when we're doing our training on, on either on a simulated aircraft or on a live aircraft, it's important that we train how we actually run the mission. Um, and we need to, I guess, consider how the other nations that we frequently deal with, you've heard we've often deal with the people from the UK and the US, and they use similar aircraft to what we do, and we do have an agreement that whichever ever aircraft is available, that we can operate on the back of theirs and they can operate on the back of ours, and that's what we do. And we have some commonality with the way that we do. Of course, um, it's important to note that wherever possible, <coughs> Australian health professionals will do our best to escort Australians whenever they travel on an international aircraft. So if we've got American aircraft that's taking our patients to um, a, an American hospital, we'll make sure that we're there as well just looking after our health professionals, making sure there's an Aussie there for them. So I guess, you know, to, to summarise our particular part, um, one of the big focuses for us is crew resource management. And it is for the, uh, is, is for the pilots as well and the air crew. So, um, you know, they all have a number of flower, uh, hours a day they're allowed to fly, um, and we have a number of hours that, that really we should only be working to. And so when we plan, that's why we can work out how many teams we might need in a contingency. We need to work out how many litres of oxygen we might need for the patients, worst case scenario, ventilator demands, all of those sorts of things. Um, how many amps we're actually going to draw off the power system. So do we need to look at bringing another power converter on board? Um, <clears throat> one of the things we get around, around that is, is lots of planning. So there is a lot of planning before a mission. It doesn't matter how um, how short or long or how urgent it is, we have a certain way of doing business and that's because we don't want anything to fall through the cracks and find that some piece of equipment's been left on the tarmac back where we've left because once you're in the air, there's no going back. If you've missed something, um, then you have to do without it for the flight and so we don't ever want to be in that situation. It's really noisy um, on the back of the plane, um, so my probably like my last 
last point is on communication. So it's really hard to communicate, particularly on the C130 HERC. Um, often we're wearing um, hearing protection as well. So we have to have some a short, uh, succinct way of handing over the patient. So we do use ISBAR for that, and we used clear documentation. But just to get on um, um, on top of what Major Rogerson was saying in terms of some of the new technology, so one of the things we're looking at at the moment is a uh, all-in-one monitor that can do some video laryngoscope um, capability and also some ultrasound capability. Um, it can all um, Basically, uh, it creates a patient record which can transmit wirelessly. But what, in fact, we can do is then we have throughout the Defence Force commonality and equipment. The idea then would be to download an information on a USB wristlet. That wristlet goes on the patient. When they get transferred to the next facility with the monitor, they put it in the monitor. All the information is there right from the first time they've been monitored. And when they get to the facility, we'll actually be able to print off a summary of the whole of their care, the snapshots of, you know, you can take snapshots of the scene of the, um, of the uh, battle, you can take snapshots of the injuries that were at the time, you can take snapshots of the, the picture of the cords and snapshots of even your fast scan. So there's, the technology is really developing quite quickly. So hopefully, you know, we can um, grab that and I think Whatever happens in military medicine, you can see a lot of it then translates onto the civilian field. So I think we're very lucky um, to work between the two that we can actually see the benefits of both. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just before we close and before we thank uh, the panel, I would just like to point out that we've been incredibly well supported today by uh, three one-star officers that have... Uh, come to support their team, and uh, I might just uh, ask for your indulgence and ask if any of those officers would like to make uh, any closing remarks. Thank you, sir. How do you do? Uh, my name is Charles Neal. I'm a brigadier in the Army Reserve. I represent the diversity of this uh, conference. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around long enough to uh, see all the changes that have been reflected here in the and I joined the, uh, the military most of us could have for one ribbon for a long service and, and you can see there's a lot of colour on the people's chest here that's done a lot of work. Uh, I, in public hospitals I saw the introduction of a pulse oximeter when I was an intern. So I've got the chance to see stuff for all this. Very briefly, your conference says where to from here. I would genuinely on behalf of the, the Commodore and the Air Commodore to ask you to come down to our, our booth and have a chat. Many of the things that you've seen here today are, are just what you do in a daily practice in terms of transport. My first experience of the austere environment was the Newcastle earthquake. I was the orthopedic registrar on call. I operated for three days straight in the casualty at Nevada Hospital. And I thought, hmm, maybe this austere environment
So with that, I think we've ran a little bit over time. If there's any pressing questions, we could take them, but we don't want to hold you from uh, afternoon tea. Um, so do we have any pressing questions? Good. Um, <laughs> so just in closing, I'd like to uh, thank the senior officers, and I'd like to thank uh, all the members of our panel. It's a, it's a real privilege and an honour to work alongside people of this calibre. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the booth. Okay. See you then.